So good afternoon and welcome. It's uh, really great to be able to welcome you all, especially our speakers. Um, I'm sure that people will be coming in. It's one o'clock, so they'll they'll sort of trickle in throughout the afternoon. Um, this seems to be the last uh, couple of years, the year of centenaries. Last year we celebrated the centenary of uh, IMP, which was really fantastic, and I'm glad to report that he's still going strong, uh, which is which is great. And um, uh, this year uh, there is the centenary of uh, Paul Rudolph uh, and, of course, Bruno Zevi, who we are celebrating uh, this uh, afternoon. Uh, this is an event that's sponsored by the Walter Gropius Lecture Fund, which is uh, very appropriate given that Zevi studied here during the time of, uh, <clears throat> of Walter Gropius, and I'm sure things could be said about that uh, relationship as well uh, when he was here in the 40s. Just before we start, um, I want to also just remind everyone that there will be a noontime talk given by Elisa Silva, uh, one of the faculty who's teaching an option studio in landscape architecture on Monday. And next Thursday on November 1st, as part of the fall open house, the evening of the advanced studies uh, programs presentation, Irma Boom will be here from, uh, uh, from Amsterdam uh, to uh, do that evening lecture. And Irma has recently been working very closely with uh, Rem Kulhas on a mega publication project, which is now the kind of reincarnation of all the research on elements. And a really amazing new book uh, has now been published by Tashen. So Irma will be talking about that, uh, the work of GSD students, and her own, uh, her own work, which is really, I'm sure, going to be something very, very special. Uh, they, they, this uh, event really started uh, with uh, Jean-Louis Cohen. This is uh, essentially, uh, today's event is his uh, brainchild. It's, it's a conversation that started maybe some three years ago. Since then, there's been a um, great exhibition that also um, uh, Jean-Louis and Pipo Chiora, who is the curator at Maxi, have been involved with and also uh, has resulted in this book, Zevi's uh, Architects, History and Counter-History of Italian Architecture 1944-2000, which I recommend to you. And many of our speakers are also uh, authors uh, of various essays uh, in, this, uh, in this book. Uh, I think uh, this is also really uh, an interesting moment to be looking at the work of Zevi. I was fortunate enough to, act to spend quite a bit of time uh, at the exhibition with people, and it's a really wonderful exhibition that shows Zevi as a historian, a critic, uh, a protagonist of, of, of architecture, and uh, someone who also made very special exhibitions. It was really interesting to see his early exhibitions and the design of the exhibition and the quality of the exhibition, looking at architectural history. And of course, knowing that he was constantly connecting history to the present, so to speak, and connecting uh, uh, modernism to, um, to, that, to that history. Um, um, Zevi came here during the war years uh, as a, as a Jewish uh, architect, it was also very important that he was here during the war years, and I think that that is something that I'm sure you will hear about, and it's very present in his uh, in his work and in, in his idea, especially seeing really some of the later um, preferences and projects where he's looking at Danny Lipskin and, and becoming, in a way, I felt much more um, conscious of his own Jewish identity much more explicitly. Um, so uh, very, very complicated and complex character. But, but the fact that he was so outspoken about architecture and really trying to um, communicate architecture with others, this is why we also um, use, essentially, the subtitle of one of his books to speak about this idea of how to see architecture 
from his subtitle where he says how to look at architecture. And this, this, this specific way of trying to um, communicate maybe to non-architects the way in which, the manner in which uh, one has to actually look at contemporary architecture and his, his commitment to sort of making uh, you know, new architecture which is so present in the exhibition where basically many of the people that he supported are being beautifully presented through photographs and models and so that's also an aspect of Zevi that we don't really know so much about that Zevi's uh, intellectual project is also manifested through a vast body of projects and I think that would be fantastic for us to become more familiar in a way with the work of those Italian architects many of them known but many of them uh, you know not so well known to us clearly when he was here the work and focus on Frank Lloyd Wright was was one thing that impressed him uh, a lot and his focus on organic architecture so um, there are many complex uh, dimensions to his work and I'm really looking forward to our two panels that will be discussing this work. The first panel will be moderated by Michael Hayes and he will introduce the speakers, so I won't introduce them. And the second panel by uh, Tony Vettler. We're really happy that the two of you have agreed to moderate these two sessions. Michael, of course, needs no introduction. He's been part of the school and such an important part of the school and part of our sort of thinking about architectural history and theory. And of course, Tony, really an amazing historian, so influential, uh, involved at many schools from the UK to Princeton to UCLA to Cornell to, uh, to Cooper. Um, and so we're very happy, and to Yale. So we're very happy that he's here with us. And uh, we love reading your work, and we're very happy that you're here. So please welcome Michael Hayes, who will introduce the first panel. Thank you. Thanks, Bosin. Just first, uh, some quick thanks um, to Paige Johnston for for helping organ or for organizing this um, uh, and working working very hard with the communications program. Dan Borelli and Inez um, uh, Zalduendo uh, have made a fantastic exhibition of publications related to Zavi uh, to his time here, um, which I encourage you to see. the The rare books are just being installed as we speak uh, because they had to have a, a cover but they'll be available during the during the conference um, the fact is that Zevi isn't that much discussed at the GSD and I think one of the things that's will be important about this conference is first of all to change to change that um, and second of all but it might be worth pondering as we go along why this has been why this has been the case because I think some of the things that the speakers will elucidate will actually both answer why that has been the case and why it should should change so this is what what I hope and, and I just want to say a bit about uh, the teaching of uh, think about it a little bit about the teaching at the GSD and why Zavi has not been more part of that discourse. I mean, for example, someone like um, Rudolf Wittkover, we still read um, the humanist book, mainly for the chapters on Alberti and Palladio, and I think the reason is that in a professional school and because of the ethos of the GSD, there's this sort of sophisticated formalism in Wittkover, um, but also the notion of architecture as a project in the Alberti chapter, for, well, both, the, the, this idea that architecture is a project that can go over an entire career and, and develop is something that really resonates with our students. I would even go so far to say that though Colin Rowe is still known and read, it's certainly not because of Collage City, it's because of the, the fact that he's a student of Wittkover here. It's a, different, it's a different take on him than our generation had. We read von Moos for Le Corbusier to start, and then we use uh, Jean-Louis uh, Taschen book, for example. We don't read Rowe so much on, on Le Corbusier. Banham students love Banham now. Um, it's the, the picture of him in the environmental bubble 
just drive them crazy. The the his um, his attention to gadgets and gizmos and L.A. It's it he's become for the millennials what Tafuri was, I think, for us. They they they're, they're a kind of role model almost. I'm thinking mainly about the not just about the Ph.D. students who are studying history, but even for the the science students. But it's still Tafuri here that's regarded as he's taken very seriously as a Marxist theorist, as a dialectical materialist, and studied for that as well as for being a, a brilliant historian. And I think Tafuri, in a way, helped eclipse Zevi, in a way. So I think there are two, I just want to point out two things before I introduce the first panel to think about. Zavi's association, as Mosin mentioned, with Frank Lloyd Wright and the way that he uses Wright in some ways to build the theory of organic architecture that is his claim to fame, at least in America. And it'll be very interesting to see, hear how much more complex, in fact, in fact, his writings are than just about Frank Lloyd Wright and organic architecture. Um, but I do think that, that that's the first point. For us, even if we want to know about Wright, we would go to, first to Hitchcock, but then here teaching was, is Joe Connors for the villa, for the houses, and Neil Levine. So we don't read Zavi for, for, for write, but then we also don't read Zavi for how he writes somehow. And I want to comment that just a bit. Just a bit. He tended to be less sophisticated, but I think what the audience will find out, and I didn't know, and I think we don't know, uh, not because of lack of capacity, but actually, because he, he was quite capable, but he wanted his writing to be accessible. He wanted to be heard. He wanted to be understood. Um, the the book. Uh, uh, Saber Vedere L'Architectura, which in English goes to architecture as space, how to look at architecture. This is what Roberto Dulio, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, said. He said that the book was a brilliant synthesis between the pragmatic dimension of an American textbook and the interpretation of space in the European art historical tradition. And I think that pragmatism is something that maybe is worth thinking about with um, Zavi. He wanted to be understood because he wanted to make a difference. He wanted his work on history to have a, a, an, an effect in the in the progetto actuale, in the in the in the current in the in the current action, in the contingent action. Um, Xavier's writings were actually complex, and so, and we'll see, hear that uh, in the, t the first panel, uh, and as also were his influences. Um, Dario Ricci is going to talk about uh, Xavier's writing in the context of uh, various modes of narrative fictional writing in Italy oriented toward the future, including the writings, for example, of Argonne. Well, we also read Argonne here. Um, I, mean, I mean, just so you know. Uh, yeah, okay. um, but also Italo Calvino, uh, for example. I think that this is not a well-known story that Dario will give us. Um, his work can be quite polemical. Um, he, he, organic architecture is actually for him a political architecture. It's an architecture for democracy. And it's not the just cliched bland democracy. It's anti-fascist. This, this, this is the real importance of, of democracy at his, his time. Um, his writing is his the, the the politics of his writing uh, come from close formal looking, but also prescriptions of uh, poly, uh, polygons instead of square grids, heterogeneous materials, um, and in place of sort of neo Cartesian, neo classical stone and stucco, where it's something much more uh, heterogeneous. Um, people Chora, people uh, Chora will talk about. Uh, Davies' navigation of the politics of, of Cold War space and of architecture and urbanism as agents of democracy. So let me introduce um, 
our first two panelists. Uh, Pipo Chiora, as Mosin said, um, uh, was the curator um, in, of, uh, he is the curator and organized with Jean-Louis uh, at, at Maxi in Rome uh, just just this year, the um, exhibition Bruno Zevi, uh, Storia e Contro Storia dell'Architettura. Um, he is an architect, a critic, an educator. Uh, he was a member of the editorial board of Casabella up until just a few years ago, teaches design and theory at the uh, University of um, uh, Camerino, and he's director of the PhD program at the Institute in, in Venice. In 2011, he published an overview of the conditions of architecture in Italy uh, entitled Senza Architectura, La Ragione per una Crisis, the, the, the reason for the crisis, the crises. He's the author of a number of books, including uh, some monographs, including a monograph on Peter Eisenman, as well as uh, Quaroni. Uh, uh, and as, as well as the publications on photography and contemporary work. Um, uh, Daria Ricci did her PhD in history and theory from at, at Princeton University. Her, dis her dissertation, which of course includes Zevi, focused on architecture historiography, but 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 as a kind of literary genre, or or in the context of literary genre, genre in the uh, middle of the 20th century, figures as I said like Argan, Italo Calvino and many others, as well as Bruno Zevi. Um, her research interests also include um, modern and contemporary art and architecture and popular culture. She just finished a postdoctorate at Yale, um, uh, where, she's, where she's working on this project, uh, and also a new project studying the writings of the novelist uh, Edith Wharton. Um, so I invite Pipo first, uh, and then, uh, then Daria. Welcome. So I, do I manage from here, no? I think the green, yeah. I have no, 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 dust, no digits here. Just, just the, yeah, but he should, but he needs to, yeah. Oh, sorry. How do I go back? Yeah. So 15 minutes are very quick, so I will, I will be running. I. I'm not going to read, I'm sorry, I'm Italian. I belong to the lowest level of humanity, curators, so I'm excused. Uh, so, <laughs> but to say a few things in 15 minutes, I need to be uh, sharp. So we did this, none of us, not, not Jean-Louis, nor I, maybe none of us come from that Zevi environment. We are all more or less Tafurian. I studied in Venice, everybody, I mean, we, so we had to rebuild our history, re, do a recognition, an investigation on our own history to understand why it would be important and make sense to study Zevi and to do an exhibition on Zevi today. Besides the pleasure of fighting one year a day with Ada Chiara, Zevi's daughter, every, every day. Um, so I, I, uh, my 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 idea was to for this for this conference was to understand why Zevi is still important today because Italy is still the result of uh, a post-war series of events and ideas and and positions which is very strong conditioning the situation of architecture and of the country today. So Zevi is only a way to. Uh, to investigate, the con I'm a curator, so I, I, am a, I have this terrible thing of being somehow a, a presentist, the worst possible thing in the world. So I want to read Zevi to understand what happens now to us and to me. And so my secret curatorial agenda for the exhibition, which was interesting, its exhibition was important because Zevi is a different way to look at it, the history of Italian architecture. As Martian said, many of you don't even know many of the architects we discovered there are very interesting and they were, of course, shadowed by Tafuri. Uh, the second thing was this incredible power that Zevi developed in terms of communicating architecture, redefining all the medias, all the languages. And the third one is, of course, is investigation of the power of historiography as an, as an agent in society. But then there was my fourth secret point, which was to use Zevi to understand why we don't have a very good shape for architecture today in Italy, and so on how 
the situation which blocked him, which really was his failure, so we're talking about a failure today, uh, is still somehow operating in our uh, situation. Forgive me for my English. Uh, four premises to understand this frame. The first one is this obsession with the word politics that you find today in every uh, conference, every student's thesis, every architecture essay. Uh, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it does not make sense, but there is definitely an obsession in this field. The second point is to remember, to remind you that Italy was a kind of a Cold War lab because you had a super strong right-wing Catholic party and a super strong that you wouldn't find in any other country in Europe, communist party. So the Cold War was in the country and we were also on the border of the West. So the presence of the Cold War was very, very strong and it was communicated in a very colorful way also. You see there uh, Aldo Moro and, Andre, uh, and Berlinguer, when finally in 1978 made a coalition government uh, between the Communist Party and the Christian Democrat Party, which was exactly the squeezing condition for Zevi's ideology of this secular liberal uh, state. Uh, the third point is, of course, the politicization of Italian architecture. We know from the beginning, you all have read Jean-Louis books, uh, I mean, all of you have written on this. Uh, we know that you, we could not understand the history of Italian architecture if we don't look at it through the frame of political ideas. The, my first books were probably Tafuri and Quaroni. Tafuri was made a professor by Zevi and Quaroni. That's interesting. And, and, and uh, Porta e Bonfanti, a very bad book but with a lot of information on, on BBPR. The, fa the last and problematic issue is that this per the, the, today we still have to face a, a suffering bad condition for Italian architecture. It's not a good country for young architects, so it's not a good place for architects to be considered from society. So for me, the reasons of this suffering condition are still to be uh, found in the beginning of this history, in the early post-war uh, times. Or we have no architecture, or we have very little architecture, sometimes architecture we could discuss, but the only thing people know around the world about Italian architecture today is Her, Her Majesty, Renzo Piano and, and the Vertical Forest by Stefano. Uh, the third point is uh, Zevi has, of course, as Michael was saying before, has a progetto storico. No? Progetto storico is a sentence we learned with Tafuri, but actually Zevi had a very strong progetto storico, and his progetto storico was exactly in between politics and architecture. It was shaped by uh, an ideological development he had while he was in America, in the years he was in, in Harvard, I mean six months in New York and then three years in Harvard, uh, working with these people that were the only kind of liberal, uh, really liberal democratic uh, socialist people in Italy who do, do want to stay, they didn't want to stay nor with the right-wing Catholics neither with the communists. So that's where Zevi wants to position himself and, and Saper Vedere l'Architettura is the architectural trans, translation of this point of view. Looking at architecture trying to squeeze between the, like the tradition of classicism and uh, let's say the fascist uh, uh, legacy in architecture and on the other side this hyper-functionalist uh, legacy coming from Le Corbusier which he didn't like at all in the end, or he liked it. And the, the result of all this, the synthesis of all this, was of course this idea of organic, an idea of organic which was not there actually in America, but it's an idea of organic is shaped, uh, giving his own reading of Frank Lloyd Wright, a reading which was not present in America, I would say, even in, 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 in the GSD at the time. But organic architecture for him was exactly, uh, in 1938, Zavi gives gave his first public speech at this Littoriali, the fascist uh, university uh, 
uh, meeting, and he finds this way to say things he could not say by supporting medieval architecture as the solution to this fight between modern and traditional. Organic becomes the next step. Organic is for him the solution of this opposition between the modern and the traditional. Uh, this, this project, which is the project that want to transform Italy into a democratic, liberal uh, country, will, will be a failure. We all know it will be a failure. Of course, it will not be a failure only for Zevi, but it will be a failure for an important uh, bunch of intellectuals like Olivetti, which we see here with Bruno Zevi, like Bobbio, like the, all the Italian secular, progressive, liberal um, uh, group of people that were trying to define a country which had not to be uh, yielding not to the Vatican and neither to, uh, to the communist side. So it was a big defeat, uh, but it was the defeat of a group which had their own uh, political project. Comunità, of course, by Olivetti, started as a cultural, architectural, sociological magazine and becomes a political movement. Il Mondo di Pannunzio was a super interesting, uh, super interesting uh, newspaper, which was really representing the position of the, of the only people which in Italy didn't want to take a place between the right and the, and the left. And Savi was going together with all these people. But this political project, this hypothesis, was uh, collapsed, was uh, defeated completely. But this kind of strange opposition's alliance that there was between the right wing and the left wing. Togliatti and, and De Gasperi, the two major figures of post-war Italy, the one, De Gasperi representing the Catholic tradition and incredibly powerful presence of the Vatican in the definition of the, politi of the political projects in Italy, and on the other side, Togliatti, which was trying to shape, already trying to shape the Italian Communist Party with some difference uh, compared to the Stalinist elections coming from, from Moscow. So these two, these two political areas invaded the whole field and basically left no room, no possibility for this kind of de liberal democratic project, which was Zevi's ideas. But the interesting thing is that the same uh, phenomena we can see in politics basically happened also in architecture. Uh, this idea of an architecture of democracy, of an architecture of genius and talented architects who would build beautiful buildings, uh, engaging the concept of space because Zevi is very much about space, was, was never really winning in Italy. You had two possibilities. On one side, you have Luigi Moretti building the Watergate here. And Luigi Moretti was the favorite architect of these right-wing Vatican-fueled uh, developers, the Società Generale Immobiliare, and many other companies that were basically building the country. Or on the other side, you had the Venetian utopia, no? so Venezia and this idea of no, no, no to the intellectual individuality, not to the genius, yes to the design of the city, yes to utopia, yes, I mean, we are very, very, we're cutting very hard because of the time. Uh, and Tafuri has a clear way to dismiss, no? Tafuri always put some words to dismiss this project using this terrible word terza forzista, which means somebody which is in between the two major lines. And is, it's a word he always used with contempt. Uh, intelligentsia is another slight message of contempt. So this idea for Tafuri that these people would not take position pro or against Marxism, or pro or against uh, the Catholic project was for him uh, a sign of, of a non possible political, architectural, and aesthetic project. Uh, and so for Tafuri, the, uh, Olivetti is a problem, Zev is a problem, Bobbio is a problem, Eco at a certain point is a problem. I mean, Vittorini, of course, writes a lot and very well about this. But I think this is at the same time the collapse of a political project, which is still a problem for my country, and the collapse of an aesthetic and professional project that Zev was carrying on. So I think it's very interesting to 
to reread the history of Italian architecture through the Zavis frame because it allows us, it helps us to bring out, to, to make these things very, very, very visible. Of course, Zevi, Zevi, Zevi was failed. I mean, Zevi's failure was luckily then a very productive failure because he was a super active, a super activist, an incredible uh, agent in many words. In, in, ten, in 10 meters of our exhibition, we find the work of a critic supporting the project of transit, of somebody running for elections, of some somebody writing books, uh, an educator who leaves the university 15 years in advance, and so on. So, so Zev is a lot of things. That's why it's difficult to compress it into a frame or into a slogan. But I think the most interesting part, I think both Jean-Louis and I have been accused of dismissing a little bit the last period of his life. Uh, which we somehow did consciously. I think for us the most interesting part goes from Metron from 1945 to when he leaves the school, 1978, 1980. So the, the, the big success of postmodernism in Italy, which was a personal defeat for him. But then he was, about, he was doing, using all the medias. No, that's very interesting because he was active in all the architecture medias, uh, reviews. Uh, writing on newspapers and weekly magazines. He's been writing on Espresso for 50, 50 years, 50 anni of columns, uh, associations, now the funding of Chica, we see um, uh, Rickwert also here, uh, operative criticism, and there's not time here to start this discussion, but this would be a very interesting one. Uh, curating, I think Zevi was the first, uh, the first one in Italy who was doing uh, historical exhibition in a, in, a, in a curatorial way, in a completely different way than was before, like deconstructing the work of Brunelleschi, Michelangelo, Biagio Rossetti, and turning it into something else. Uh, broadcasting, he found that the three months after uh, free television was allowed in Italy, Zevi opened his own television, and he broadcasted for three years from his house, that's the antenna on his house, then running to elect uh, then communicating. Now we also, Hans Hurik and, and Petra and Beatriz uh, wonderfully laying on a bed in Venice, but Zevi was already laying on a bed in television with Amanda Lear 20 years before. Uh, then the last, the last part, since we are at the end, uh, what, happens in, what happens in 1978? Yeah, Zevi leaves the university. Portuguese does the first Biennale. Zevi gets mad because he thinks that postmodernism is exactly the form in which society and, and, and architecture is defeating his project. And it becomes even more polemic, more against, more uh, running. So just to close three, uh, Three phases in his work, I would say. The first phase in his critical work goes from 45 to uh, 59, and it's when he loves the architects that everybody loves. I mean, you would find on Casabella the same architects you would find on Metron. Then the second period, which is more interesting, I think, for us, from when he opens L'Architettura to the end of the 60s, when he really is scanning and scouting for super interesting architects that were not accepted in the court of Tafuri. And then the last part, which is more or less uh, a mess, and, and where he kind of endures uh, the new architecture on a, from a very strange point of view, sometimes more religious than architectural. That's it. This is, this is only a few dates. I mean, this is Italy today, and I think this political situation is still the product of, this, of these things we've been discussing. Now, and, and a few moments, and then I close. 45, the foundation of APAO, super important. And APAO, I mean, I, when, I, when I went through a few things in this last year, I thought that the model for the association of APAO was the AEA, because there was six months of the AEA, and APAO is a school, a journal, and an association. So I think that there, is a, there is a link. Uh, 1948, Zevi goes to Venice, invited by Samona. 
Samona is putting up a new UAV, and it's a UAV which is extremely different by the one that would be then shaped by Tafuri from 1964. And then I thought we could do this lecture of the three ways of being Venetians, which I think we should do once. Uh, then in 1960s, he founds the Instituto di Storia, uh, and he's the one who puts Tafuri on the chair in Venice. 1951-54, La Martella. La Martella, it's both the biggest success of this Olivetti Coine for architecture, but also the big defeat of a political project for the country. This is Zevi on the site where they were opening the, the village. Uh, I think La Martella is an under the uh, estimated project, which should be studied longer. Uh, it, for me, it reminded me of some other things very interesting that were happening in the world in the same time, and I think we should spend some time on that. 59 is the foundation of INARC. INARC is very important, I am sorry, because it's the, the INARC, the association INARC is proposing to the architects to build an alliance with with the developers. I mean, on one side you had the Venetian school, the public client, the Italy of uh, the peripheral, the suburban buildings. Zevi was inviting the architects and the, and the investors together in, in, in ARC because they, he thought that there would be an alliance and this alliance would produce good architecture and democracy. The Studio Asset, this is another incredible story of the gem session of the most interesting Roman architects trying to build uh, the city with one project in 1967. It's probably the last moment when Zevi was at the center of the discussion for, the, for Rome, but also for the country. And then 1978, he leaves the, he leaves the university 15 years before retirement and uh, go away for optimism. And I leave the chair. And then he becomes a senator, and he becomes a senator in the same election with the famous porno star, and in the same party with the famous porno star, Cicciolina. This is the exhibition. I thank you, sorry for running in this crazy way, but I thought it could be a nice frame for your most, more, more sophisticated uh, papers. Grazie. Ada Chiara. Uh, so I'm wearing the same, well, what is the book? <laughs> the catalog? <laughs> but it was an, <laughs> it was, well, it was more like, it was like Halloween, but then, it, <laughs> but then it's, it's actually the same, uh, right, the, the, the exhibition, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm, talk I'm actually uh, talking about the first period, which is very political. As you've seen, like, Zevi was always uh, political. And I'm not touching about politics at all, so I'm really the counterpart. Uh, because Zevi wanted to study literature, and his father wanted him to become an engineer, so probably architecture. Thank you. And um, writing about architecture was a good uh, uh, compromise. Uh, so my uh, paper focuses on uh, his early writing and what I basically talk as a trilogy is different tones and style and mainly how it was basically part of a cultural panorama in Italy. Uh, so basically, starting in between the two world wars, uh, Zevi published three seminal books. Uh, 1945 is Verso l'Architettura Organica, translating in towards an organic architecture in uh, 1950. Uh, Saper Vedere in 1948, translating in Architecture Space 1957. And finally, Storia dell'Architettura Moderna 1950. That's exactly when the first uh, period of Zevi ends, which was never translated into English, but uh, for instance, in Spanish. So the three books were all published by Inaudi, is a based in Turin, and this demo demonstrates the micro history of a change in historical narratives uh, just in just two decades that happened not in architectural history but also in uh, literature again in Italy. And uh, uh, so they turned the writing of architectural history into a critical practice, one in which different narrative modes are intertwined with the making of history, and in other words, with social and political events. 
uh, but again, it's not only uh, related to his uh, uh, work. So first, history is narrated as myth, as an idealized reality. For Zevi, this is the myth of America, pre-World War II, a new democratic world, and the architecture pioneers, and here seen as uh, right. Second is Saper Vedere, which is more a textbook, a guide to instruct a wider audience. The historian becomes a guide who educates and informs a larger public, not only a specialized uh, uh, audience, but also those general interested in architecture. So my mom read this, this book. Um, finally, and not without coincidence, after the war, public needed certainties, so Zevi aimed to write this reassuring and comprehensive uh, story and cover 200 years of uh, history. Uh, and again, he published this with the Turing Base and now the publishing house that basically intended to target a wider public, not only uh, architect. Uh, and similarly, basically, uh, Zevi was creating an architecture series for the publishing house and basically having scientific rigor, but a more approachable uh, language. So Zevi first uh, published in, in 45 uh, uh, Versum Architettura Organica, but during the 40s, Italian historians uh, and literary critics had expressed their enthusiasm in the discovery of, of America, considered as a United States, for instance, uh, America Primo Amore by um America First Love by Soldati in 35, uh, obviously uh, the fascination with the uh, pioneer in Chicago school and Frank Lloyd Wright, but also the narrative of Midwestern authors like Sherwood Anderson, William Falcon, and Saul Bellow. And uh, uh, Elio Vittorini, which was again highly politically edited. Uh, um, Americana and saying that by discovering Midwestern American uh, writers, we could actually understand uh, Italy. And uh, this is uh, Italy at the edges, so it's like Turin or Sicily, uh, Sardinia, it's not Venice, it's not Rome, it's not Milan. So it's, it's uh, that's, and also the in Audi publishing houses in, in Turin. And uh, mm, but as uh, um, Manfredo Tafuri would write, uh, towards an organic architecture was the manifesto not only of an historiographical choice, but also a principle of action. So the book basically revises the history of modern architecture by promoting Wright as its ultimate uh, hero, the poet of the prairies. Wright created the myth out of his fight to emancipate American architecture from European culture, so it's this re reverse. But Zevi also saw in Wright the prehistory of modern architecture, the search for myth as a primitive symbols that the mechanic uh, civilization would otherwise repress and against the fascist myth and uh, it was obviously uh, responding to Gideon mechanization takes command uh, and we can also see the very Italian attempt to find historical roots even if geared towards basically a future uh, practice <laughs> Uh, this book length essay, as Zevi described it, was written to amend the historical perspective that most notorious histories, storia, of modern architecture by Platz, Pevnes, Gizion, and Beren had built, and that culminated in the names of Gropius and Le Corbusier. So he did basically the same by having right as uh, at the end of this progression. The subtitle in Italian reads, Essay on the Development of Architectural Thought in the Past 50 Years, and stresses the evolution of architectural thought when basically moving forward, uh, but at the same time building history. And again, this is uh, the Italian version. The English has a really different and presuppose a different uh, reader. Zevi's book was a response to Gideon's uh, space, time and architecture, but still was, according to his own word in the book preface, a chronicle rather than a history. And I'm here deviated uh, to insert again uh, Zevi's work uh, in the 40s in Italy. Uh, so basically, in, in, um, so in architecture as in literature, the 40s are a farewell to the genre of chronicles. Uh, so in 46 and 47, for instance, Pratolini uh, wrote uh, uh, two books, Present and Chronicles, so Chronicles of Poor Lovers and Family Chronicle. They were representative of a cultural trend. 
and well, he, this it's, it's okay. This was basically before a Cronache changed his name in, in L'Espresso, and Zevi was writing a column, so geared basically to a, a well, in, in the UK, you would say the lay press, so general magazines. And uh, so this was before uh, and changed the name. So it was all about chronicles. Um, so like you see the gossip. Uh, but the mid-50s, the genre of chronicles would become obsolete. So in 55, the same author of the chronicles published Il Metello, which was uh, uh, put together in a title, an Italian story. So we are going towards like stories and not chronicles anymore. That ratified the end of neorealism, which despite its cinematographic characters, uh, probably true to life, black and white, uh, uh, and unembellished narrative, uh, so basically chronicle. And so this is uh, the last. Uh, uh, book. S but in 55, and this is the last, uh, mixing uh, historical and fiction was not legitimate. So this is a famous the, uh, Leopard that was rejected by Vittorini three times in 55 because mixing uh, historical and fiction was not uh, legitimate yet. Uh, probably, I mean, again, this is Italo Calvino. Early writing is also realist, so almost like a chronicle. Uh, this is one. So he's basically two first two books are not translated it was realism was not Calvino's forte uh, but probably the last of his realism is a plunge into real estate which I think is more interesting than uh, invisible cities um, is a fictive as though truthful story about building construction and evoke the construction boom and the building speculation of the, of, uh, the 50s and basically epitomizes his view on architecture and they were reading each other even like the super studio they were all with the touring uh, publishing house, so in Audi. Um, it was conceived around 55, even if it's been published uh, later, and they now they had earlier suggested to actually title Chronicles of the 50s, and then it actually shifted into the uh, story, and, and then Calvino actually changed style in the fictive, uh, as we know him. So being, going back to Zevi, in 45, upon, upon his return in Rome, Zevi opened the magazine Metro, which chronicled what was happening in architectural production, but ceased its publication nine years later in 54, when it started Architettura Cronica and Storia, in which chronicles and basically storia so both narratives are like synthesized in, in the word architecture. Um, in an article published in Metron in 49, Zevi further explained his depth to Wright and not Gideon for introducing him to ideas about space. And I open a quote, I will only mention, I will limit myself to briefly mention a single point which seems the most important and in every way the most vital to architecture. I refer to the spa spatial conception. The great contribution of Wright has been to bring up the problem again specifically in terms of interior uh, space. So to this respect, um, Wright's work is the prelude to Zevi's second major book, Saper Vedere, whose literal translation is who, How to Look at Architecture, uh, but has been yeah, translated as architectural space. Uh, and this is the, actually uh, the, is the exact translation, and uh, whereas the words is a really different uh, uh, animal. Um, so the book came three years later, two after two words. Uh, it was more a didactic tool, a manual to guide and lead the reader toward the analysis and understanding of architecture, the attempt to define architecture as space. Saper Vedere fits in the educational, more than critical book, in that Zevi foremost wants to instruct his audience what architecture is. Zevi opened the book by lamenting, obviously, uh, and it says, according to Zevi, every book, every magazine, lament an apology about basic architecture education and information. That at that point are more or less the same. So they, the critics, lament that the public, and I'm quoting, the public is interested in painting and music, sculpture, or literature, but not architecture. Anyone would be ashamed of not knowing a painting by Matisse or a poem by Eluard, but would be at ease in confessing they have no idea who Buon Talenti or Notre I are, and, I, and the quote. Um, 
so historians and critics can reverse uh, this problem. It is the staff task of the historian to integrate architecture in a wider discourse and have it aligned with the other arts, just like Benedetto Croce idealism implied and as Einaudi intended. And nevertheless, the book maintains what the title promised. It served as a teaching tool, as a textbook uh, in every university. I studied in Florence, so I read Zevi and I didn't read Tafuri. And uh, to show past example, to encourage future project, even though without the same impact, at least in Italy, that on the larger public that the 1950 storia would later have. Um, so Sapervedere is basically a collection of Italian architecture, but not a, a comprehensive historical survey yet. And the steps towards the storia came when Sapervedere and its uh, illustrative apparatus led to a now this publication plan for an historical architecture atlas. So storia begins as the revision of two words, uh, so written in 45. Um, is, so they've informed a now that it wished to print a new version of two words since the book is now not only offers a new approach, but also the quality and interest of comprehensive text of history of modern architecture. Also, I would like to change its title to organic architecture instead of two words, considering that orga organic is now a data and not only an approach. Uh, and in 48, uh, the word towards no longer applied. Also, propelling tendency towards the future had become the present, and myth become obsolete. Then Sajevi suggests, Zevi suggests another title uh, and says, I started the third and hopefully last version of Storia. So the, sorry, the previous was modern architecture from functional to organic. The book is becoming a monumental work that will become independently from the values of its ideas, a fundamental and essential tool to architecture students and scholars. So Zevi asked not to mention two words because this book started as a revision of the first work, does not have anything to do with it any longer, be now the comprehensive story of one and a half century. And I'm towards conclusion. So the story remains surprisingly untranslating into English, even if the rewriting, as we can think of it, presents uh, some original points. Among Zevi's enjoyable pages of narrative, as Tafuri labeled them, Zevi persistently distinguished between works of poetry and works of prose, building versus. Uh, so, versus architecture, namely literature. If the intent was that of writing a comprehensive book, Zevi succeed in having this uh, reassuring wide-ranging uh, narrative that does not allow gaps or discontinuity, but achieve an integration of characters and movement, a history that ends, not a chronicle that terminates. And uh, yeah, my time is almost over, but I basically the Fury um, version says this is basically a suggestive tale, account, whose omissions owed much to still embryonic historiographical research and whose daring judgment were soon contradicted by fact. And indeed, the story was probably more objective historical account for its author than uh, for its reader. So the main contribution of Storia is really to try to stress the importance of history as a method to design architecture, to be taught at the drawing table, insisting on the integration between past history and present practice, adhering to the past to comprehend the present. So funny, the future is now gone in 1950, as Zevi had emphasized in the preface of the book. And it represented the wider and most comprehensive uh, achievement in architecture history so far, and it stayed, at least in Italy, for almost a decade with no competition because, uh, for instance, Pesner was published in 45, only re editing in 83, Space Time and Architecture translating in 54, and Benevolo only in the 60s. So Zevi's story remained for long the last and only attempt in architecture history before the proliferation of multiple postmodern uh, stories. Thank you. I am. Thank you both, Daria, people. So um, the politician and the... Yeah. politician and, and the, the writer. And the writer, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, just, I'm, uh, I'm gathering my... And I have something to say about Argan. Okay. And also, you both talk really fast, so let me... Uh, give me some time. I'm trying to... Um, 
I'm trying to bring the two together together somehow and also let me say for the front row feel free Im to jump in immediately because it's a, it's, it's a, it could be a very informal discussion and I will turn to the the audience uh, as soon as I can but I'm trying to construct something and it has to do both of you mentioned in different ways a kind of it's not exactly a third way, but a, a, a getting in between communism and tradition, Catholicism and, and communism. I mean, sorry, yeah, mo, mo, yeah, mo, yeah, mo, modernity and tradition, communism and Catholicism. Um, and even, Daria, I can't remember the words you used, but there was some sense, not, not dialectic, but rather a more of a kind of middle, right? And, and, and I'm wondering if, if, if Tibertino, you showed it very, yeah. very quickly. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but if Tibertino, which is a social housing... Uh, uh, um, in a casa. Uh, yeah. yeah, in a casa Project. in the uh, 50s, early to mid 50s. And the brief mention of Super Studio as, in a way, the other of Tibertino somehow, but still both could be sought, both modes could be saw as a critique of, 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 of sort of yeah, uh, pre-war modernism, yeah, 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 pre yeah. modernism um, and both having legacy that I would say could even certainly comes up to postmodernism yeah. with, mm -hmm. with Kohlhaas yeah, on the one, Kohlhaas and Chumi on the one side yeah, yeah. and you know, the, the, the historicist on the other side. But did Zavi ever, it, 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 did he, it, was he hanging on so much to the pre-war work of Wright and others that, that he couldn't, and I know we're very late in his career, especially with Super Studio, but I'm thinking about early, before uh, No Stop City, the work they were doing, the more conceptual work mm -hmm. before No Stop City, was already late 50s, so it's not completely incompatible, right? Did he did he not keep up? Were those two extremes? Why? Because they seemed they would did he, they would lead him to a kind of renewal of what of what the future might be, rather than the fail. It, they might it might have prevented the failure that you documented. Is that you see what I'm trying to set up? Uh, a different dialectic. Yeah that comes later in his life, but in some ways at, at the peak of his power in terms of publicity and, and uh, propaganda and, and education, in some ways the peak of his yeah. power, but did not enter into his thought, even though you both show it's, it's part of the surrounding. Living on Florence, maybe Daria can, can answer better. Tiburtino is... Tiburtino is the, let's say, the manifesto of Apaho. Tiburtino is completely Zevi. I mean, Tiburtino ah. is uh, all the architects that all the architects of Tiburtino are registered in Zevi's association. And of course, then he says he doesn't like it later, but also Guaroni says he doesn't like it six years after he's done it. No, Tiburtino is something that Daria described very, but sophisticatedly she didn't mention. Tiburtino is neorealism, no? And neorealism was, was, you know, we need to consider that Italy before the war, that the modernist architects have been working with the fascists. Traditional architects have been working with the fascists. So this, this, this idea of something, something, looking for something which is always not here, neither there, but in between, or somewhere else, so heterotopia, that's, that's Tiburtino. So Tiburtino is the in-between. It's not it's Tiburtino one, is exactly not, the in-between. Okay, it's okay. the in-between because okay. it's vernacular, but it's not, okay, I mean, okay. monumental. It's modern, but it's not abstract. Mm -hmm. and and to add, like the yeah, was, then also you have the Florence side. Well, it, it also has the, the Tiburtino was there to see this like end of chronicle in architecture. Yes. In a sense, it was used like set design in neorealism, in which you had this like fake, uh, uh, simple black and white uh, uh, chronicle of uh, life. Mm -hmm. But then basically. Then, on it the other hand, Tiburtino is, is, is not a bad place to be. Yeah. I mean, it's, right. in the end, it works. I mean, if you live in Tiburtino today, you're not unhappy. I consider La Martella as the 
the more sophisticated version right. of Tiburtino, right. more interesting. But Tiburtino is an interesting side where I don't think Zevi had anything to do with Super Studio. I mean, the no. the, the connection point was Kenny probably was, in no, Florence. No, was Calvino. Or Calvino. Uh, we hated Calvino in the uh, 80s because no, no. He, he went with Portuguese, <laughs> yes, of course. It was basically yeah. Super Studio <laughs> were leading, reading Calvino. Calvino was editing all the architecture, right? I see. So, so play, I, I want to say something to the audience, just yes. because I'm not sure that, that all the students will even know Tiburtino. Yes, so, so Tiburtino, the, the, Daria showed just a quick drawing, can, didn't, didn't there, you? There is a picture, but it, it, shall it, I put it? People put it well being in between vernacular and some, something more sophisticated modernism. But in the United States, it leads pretty directly to one version yeah, there is, of... Yeah, there is realism in America. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, it leads, it the explanation for the yeah. Tiburtino Italian, is... Yeah. I mean, the typical explanation for the Tiburtino is the neorealist, the neorealist cinema. Visconti yeah. does this film on the, on the Sicilian fishers. The film wants, wants to refuse, to reject yeah. the intellectual language and it's spoken in dialect, and finally nobody understands. So the Italian films has had to be subtitled to go to the Italian cinemas. So the criticism that Tafuri does to Tiburtino is similar, that Tiburtino mm -hmm. is not actually the popular language, but is the popular language made up by the intellectuals. Where in the end, I think the criticism is a little bit uh, I mean, uh, Tiburtino is not, a, it's not a bad project. Of course, there is ambiguity, but it was, it was a good idea, I think, to, to do that experiment yeah. at that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if we want just to show that. Yeah, and, and in the States, it just to get, um, uh, it ends up with something partially by, by people teaching at GSD, um, some of the Argentines, for example, uh, yeah. Jorge Severi, but also the influence of uh, Grest and Gondozones. It ends up as a certain kind of, yeah a certain kind of postmodernism, even at the GSD, yeah. uh, the influence, and, and would ultimately, yeah, be much more influential than... Well, number two of, of Metron, number issued, number two of Metron, there is an, an article called The Postmodern House. That's interesting. <laughs> oh, by... <laughs> and it was uh, just, and it's just back hey, from, uh, yeah, you remember? Uh, and it's Hudnett, just back from Harvard. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So what this actually, this the postmodern house, which is which is a kind of, it's also a kind of anti-urbanist. Yeah. It's a lament of the state of the city in Europe in the United States. This this leads me to to another question, which I think is not, I think it's related, but I can't say how yet. And when you talk about the construction of myth, that that Zavi, it's it's that he myth is going to be is going to lead to a solution. Myth is not going to be the solution. It's a way of that he write, he's, he's writing himself into a description of a solution, right? And I love the idea that, that he, he, he doesn't have the idea of a solution that he then describes in writing. He uses writing to find it. And I think that's a very important point of your, of your work. Um, but does the, the myth of the American prairie which is the myth that, um, that an American would, at least one of the myths that Americans yes. could associate with right, that, that right is right for, right is correct for right is wrong. America in a way yeah. that would be impossible in, the, in, in Europe yeah. in the, uh, after the war. So it, I'm trying to figure out, does that arise as a, as a contradiction or as a disturbance? Because it's so prominent in in the other, in the ways other historians treat right. Um, yeah, come away. You can start that. With no, I, I, think, I, I, I think I think for from, for 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 uh, for Zevi, Frank Lloyd Wright is on one on one aspect a rhetorical device, which which uh, Daria has more or less started to frame. But it's also this idea of a displacement. I mean, if you if you consider right in the American space, it's that no, it's a single man in the prairie. Uh, for 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 the European scenario, Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, that relationship between the human and the environment, which was missing in modernism. 
Mm -hmm. That's what that's what Zevi was looking for in Frank Lloyd Wright, and then it was the idea of space. The open space. The idea of space was nobody has had this idea of space. I mean, super, I mean, people like Super Studio, Tafuri or Peter Eisenman. Space is nowhere in these people. Mm -hmm. Zevi, two, two people had had space in Zevi's life. Frank Lloyd Wright and Luigi Moretti. Mm -hmm. So he had to speak to Moretti, mm -hmm. although Moretti was a mm -hmm. damn fascist, <laughs> because Moretti was the only one who could understand space. Mm -hmm. And, and Zavi, Zavi he looks for space when he looks for Frank Lloyd Wright, and he looks for this continuity between the human and the space, which then becomes the seven invariant, you know, right. to make it in a more like a cartoon way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's also like I think this idea of democracy, and yeah. not the, and, and, but the organic, which I think Alicia is touching more on that. But is becoming a, the anti myth, so again, mm -hmm. it's basically the fascist monument in this mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. developing, uh, mm -hmm. basically the, the open space. The, the, but the thing that probably didn't mention then Argan comes into uh, place. The other. Um, uh, at the German school, they introducing uh, yeah. uh, so Regal, uh, Regal Zedelmeyer, yeah. yeah, for yeah, yeah. Uh, Zevi mainly through Argan, but also like. Mm -hmm. own. Oh. But I, I wanted to go back to the duality. I th I wouldn't think about Zevi as duality, but more with like uh, like Vico with recurring theme yeah, yeah, that yeah. like okay, spiral. Not a not a not, not a not a Hegelian. Either, it's not, not a dialectic. Yeah, 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 not yeah, yeah. dialectic, but dialectic. it's more like a, mm -hmm. like something becomes something else, and then by re becoming something. I like something that a lot. Yes. I like that a lot. Yeah, Jeez. yeah. Yeah. Yes, this is the, 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 the dialectics of Hegel uh, revisited. No, I think I think that yeah. uh, Xavier will get back to that later. Is uh, was a weaver. He was crossing yeah. threads, and here I think one. Uh, I think what Daya said about uh, the uh, American roots of neorealism is very important. Yes, uh, one has to frame uh, the, the passion uh, Xavier had for right within the broad framework of Americanism. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. This, yeah. What no, Scrivano is called the trans transatlantic Italy, yeah. Yeah. and which is a very broad pattern, and it starts in the in the 30s already, when uh, Casabella sends Pagano to Los Angeles, uh, and he writes on Neutra, mm -hmm, yeah. when Persico writes about Persico, right in, archi yeah. uh, about, in architecture, but also in literature, yeah. in cinema, in politics, in, uh, and it's very broad uh, framework wi within fascism, both within fascism and within anti-fascism. Yeah. And, uh, and Zevi is caught, in a way we've seen, you've mentioned Zevi's uh, politics, Olivetti is one is the agent of the New Deal yeah. and of the post-war American institutions. Is yes. the one who has who who uh, pushes to a translation of Louis, Louis Mumford, who is, who is extremely important for for Zevi. Uh, and Zevi is at the crossroads. There is this very interesting moment in the early 60s. Uh, let's talk about the uh, uh, third force this terzo forzista aspect yeah. which was uh, condemned by Tafuri. Zevi is in the center because Zevi is the one who organizes a meeting, correct me if I'm wrong, between, yeah, 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 between, be between Pietro Nenni, who's it's the leader stressing. of a socialist party, and the American ambassador, where uh, Nenni convinces that uh, uh, the socialist party uh, entering in a coalition with the yeah. Christian democracy, exactly the third force, uh, was not going to uh, go against America's interests. So Zevi, yeah. in a way, uh, and his wife too, Julia, Julia create, the, yeah. uh, create the set up the stage where the third yeah, force totally. uh, is uh, is discussed in concrete terms. So you have to see uh, be also behind the Tafuri Zevi uh, relationship uh, uh, the uh, internecine fights of the Italian left. Yeah. 
And, uh, I, and I wanted to say one thing about the, the myth, which is it's also, and we'll talk again, uh, Tony, we'll get, get back to that. We'll talk again about uh, Tafuri versus David, Zavi versus Tafuri. It was very <laughs> interesting, uh, uh, very interesting uh, f series of fights, a sort of f trench war that lasted for, for decades. Mm -hmm. But at some point, uh, Zavi ma made a, Tafuri, uh, Tafuri's critique was that Zavi had produced myths, was indulging not in, in chronicles or history, but in mythology. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. Tafuri tried to de-mythify the, yeah, yeah. the historical yeah. discourse. And Zevi answered by saying it should be time to demystify the discourse of demystification. <laughs> so it, it goes <laughs> in a full circle. <laughs> Um, only a few things. Zevi leaves Venice because of that. Zevi, this is important also in terms of the history of education. Zevi leaves Venice because after this meeting with Schlesinger and Nenni in Tullia's house, in Zevi's house, there is the first center-left coalition, so the third part exists. And he leaves Venice because he wants to be in Rome, close to the government. So he moves from UAV to La Sapienza, and then the, the, the Piano di Roma, the, the, the master plan of Rome, is a result of this situation, and, and the Studio Asse is the last part. So he, and, and, and Tafuri takes over uh, the history of the, uh, the Instituto di Storia in Venice because Zevi moves to Rome and makes and chooses Tafuri as his successor failing Benevolo, which was the Catholic guy mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. this, in this fight. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, the other thing is, I think that still, I mean, the only way, the only moment Italy tried to escape this dialectic was Prodi, and, and in fact it didn't work, because the two poles wants to survive against everything. They want even to kill the country rather than giving up to the possibility of a liberal democracy in Italy. And architecture is being killed within this frame, basically. Il cadavere squisito, pure, no? I want to come back to this notion of, of space and try to feel it in a, a, in a little more tactile, corporeal yeah. way. You, you briefly showed a slide of, um, is Matt, can, can we ask Matthew to, Bring back. There's a slide of wire models. Oh, I have it, but it's my presentation. It's, it's your presentation. No, then it was his. Oh, it's not your presentation. No, ah, it's it Michelangelo. It's the Michelangelo. exhibition on Michelangelo. Yeah. But that's so, the other, yeah. so if you remember, it, it came very fast. But there, were, there's, uh, there are domes and pendentes and things of yeah. Michelangelo yeah. modeled in wire. Yeah. So I want to have that image, and I want to imagine he—he, he, I think he never did, but I, I want to imagine if he modeled some late Frank Lloyd Wright with wire, <laughs> if he modeled, and and put that on, put that in your head. Uh, one of our PhD students, uh, Natalia Escobar, is is looking at the work of Lino Bobardi, mm -hmm. and Zavi actually wrote Bobard writes Bobardi. Uh, no, he. They, get, they do a magazine together. They do a magazine, yeah. A. And when he describes her work. He describes it like it's a almost like a Dada is collage. I yeah. mean, the the, the, the Sesc Pompeia. He yeah, yeah. he describes it in terms of a intent. Oh, these are the models I'm Bravo. So I'm, so yeah. Thank you. Th <laughs> thank you. Um, the models. But imagine. I don't know, imagine Guggenheim yeah, yeah, or yeah. something like that modeled in these wires. And then imagine the Sesc Pompeia when he sees it. He sees it in much more material terms, much more, I would almost say, a um, heterogeneity, almost a collage-like. And I think he uses the word, sh the shock of the of the of the experience, yeah, but yeah, in yeah. a good way, in a good way. <laughs> but, um, is, is there something? Is, is there something? Tony was whispering that once you abstract the Baroque or you know Bernini or Michelangelo, if, if you abstract it down to wire, it becomes much more palatable yeah. as as a as a precedent. And I'm wondering, but does it also uh, does it also uh, evidence 
a, a corporeality and a materiality that he's after in what he calls organic that we're somehow missing because we abstract it too much. This is, this is my point. Yeah. This is my point. Yeah. That's a very good question. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. I have a question for uh, people apropos this image of the, it's the uh, exhibition on Michelangelo, yeah. the yeah. slight semantic Architecto. difference architect yeah. uh, organized at the Palazzo de Esposizione in Rome in 1964 with Portoghese. Portoghese. So at that time, Portoghese, who was they working on uh, Borromini uh, in particular, was Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and Zevi were close. Uh, is it possible to read these models as a sort of response to the uh, analytical models Moretti, Moretti. had done? So. Yes, in, there is, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is this German president with this Bergman. What's this guy who was doing uh, similar? I think yes. they both referred no, because, to No, because Moretti's Moretti was making, and th these were very important models which were yeah. discussed in, in an early issue in opposi of oppositions in this country. Yeah, yeah. yeah but they were, no, yeah. they were, they were yes. figure ground reversals. They were, they were solid. They, they modeled the space so, as solid. So, uh, so in this inversion between solid and void, yeah. isn't the, the Moretti, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, JV yeah. polemic embodied? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I think Moretti, oh, Tony. The, I, I think it's uh, the, the I Sorry, think they both they both there is this this, the, this German <laughs> architect in the in the twenties who does this work of I think Bergman is his name they both refer to him but I think Moretti the difference is Moretti introduces mathematics in this discussion so and Alicia could speculate on that but I mean one only sent one sentence is that Zevi through this work done by the students in Venice. He wants to move the, the discussion on language from the decoration to the space. Now, that's what the models are made in, for. In, in, in the process, destroying the space, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what interests me is the, the, if the Moretti is solid, right? He's like pouring, uh, pouring uh, casting the interior yeah. volumes yeah, in yeah, a yeah, solid yeah. block. Yeah. Uh, this is completely evaporating the space yeah. itself. Uh, but but the one thing in the middle that they're both refusing is Le Corbusier volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Ah, ah. The idea of a volume which is projected yes. from a plan, which is then concealed, uh, wrapped in a surface. The three elements of towards a new architecture. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So the volumetric agree, notion agree, yes. of uh, space uh, only disappears in Corbusier much later, when uh, L'Espace Indecible in the 19, uh, uh -huh. 1930s. Uh -huh. uh, but because Corbusier never uses the word space yes. uh, until yes, 1933, exactly, exactly. Uh, he only uses the word volume. Yeah, yeah. Zavi says that he changes the Gideon. Yeah. Uh, We're, sequence now and, and puts Zevi, uh, uh, Corbu before Frank Lloyd Wright. And I think Zevi achieves another result, uh, result here, which is historiographical. He it tries to demonstrate through this analytical work that history is an horizontal condition. I mean, we are all contemporary by taking away right, the, right. the language, the linguistic thing. These, these things are contemporary. And Zevi's yeah, yeah. idea is that we are contemporaries of Michelangelo, Borromini, yeah, yeah. Brunelleschi. So the, the models works very, work very well also That's in that yeah. sense. Yeah. I have to bring Daria back in. I cut well, you no, off. Sorry. I, I, yeah. Which is a really crude. Benedetto Croce, yeah, the of idea that of like, of course. Uh, but no, I, I was, I think, for the sake of clarity, maybe something that has to be clear is uh, he was from Rome, so the ba Barocchetto, yeah, Barocchetto Romano, so the, the, <laughs> yes, the yes. Barocco, okay, yeah, even yeah. if maybe intellectually, is not yeah. sometimes we quote, right, it's, it was embedded in uh, yeah. These buildings, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so it is mainly about creating space by carving space instead of adding. Mm -hmm. It's almost like in a sculptural way, and I think it permeates the way he writes, even if he's not always mm. acknowledging. Uh, yes, I, 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 this I, is mm -hmm. one. The second one was talking about the space of, of write. There's a typological idea also, of, like Zevi, for instance, he looks at the chimneys. Yeah. as this idea of domestic uh, fire or like you talk at the end about like happiness i mean yeah, there's yeah, a, yeah. i think there's a all like uh, light side of the day they get uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. raised but but for for daria i would like also it's important for me i think the way 
Zavi builds his language comes from politics. Yeah. Oh, it's like, the yeah, first yeah. the first times he speeches in is, is the yeah. public speech is always in political frames. Wow, wow. In Littoriali, then the the radio for the anti fascists in London, the radio in, in here in, in America. Mm -hmm. So his rhetoric is built in the in the political frame. But mm -hmm. also in this trying to bridge which is again a time specific of having rigor. I mean yeah, yeah. but also be understandable. Yeah. Like, Go straight levels. to the yeah. Straight to the point, audience. and 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 also I think this is could be interesting for the students, but generally we can say much better these things. Zevi, he is an, a 20th century intellectual. He he is controversial. I think we definitely miss the possibility of being controversial no. today, especially yeah. in academia, uh, in the world of architecture. The 20th century intellectual is controversial because you need to have a counterposition cool. to get the Hegelian to, <laughs> to, mm -hmm. a, to a point. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think this is something we miss very much. Mm -hmm. And also, Zevi considers politics something that has to get to results in life. So the architect, the professor, the designer goes out of the school and practice politics because he wants to change the situation in, in, in real life. So mm -hmm. these are two strong differences, big differences of what the situation is yeah. today. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think it would be interesting also to, yeah. to see how people react to a condition like yeah. this. Let, let's turn to the audience for question or comment. Um, Get, take the take the mic so oh. we yeah while you're on the subject of politics i've always been curious why more architects don't get into politics and there seems to be a difference between the united states and a lot of the you know like mexico or yeah. argentina or italy Latin and um, in 1961 i met with uh, bruno zavi at the suggestion of henry russell hitchcock and professor uh, garland and i'm just realizing why uh, he offered uh, me to work in his studio yeah. and uh, i decided to come to the gsd instead but I'm realizing now it was because of the political orientation that I probably had at the time. And uh, I wonder now, why do not, what, what is your idea about that? Well, I mean, we have a, we have a kind of original scene. Uh, Terragni, Libera, I mean, the heroes of Italian architecture got jobs directly from power in Italy. No? So the relation between architecture and politics was built first, I mean, if you go to the Romans, we can go, but it, for modern names, it was built in fascism. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the main client for the Italian architect till a few years ago uh, has always been the public client. So architecture was welfare. And being mm -hmm. welfare, architecture is coming from uh, from the power, and so through politics. The Italian architect is not even able to speak to the client, traditionally, because the job will come to him through politics. To do the master plan of a city in Italy till 10 years ago, you had to have an architect from the, Christian, the, the Catholic Party, an architect from the Communist Party, an architect from the Republican Party, an architect from the Socialist Party, and an architect from the uh, Liberal Party. And of course, the smallest the party, the more jobs you got. No? Uh, so so the, the reason why you can, when you read Gregotti you don't understand the word is because Gregotti does not need to be understood. Because the jobs will come to him through the mayor of Urbino will appoint Carlo Aimonino or Giancarlo De Carlo because Tafuri, who's the cre politically credited critic, tells him this is a good guy, give him a job. The job will go there even if they don't need it. So many of the works of our masters are ruins today because they were built for the pleasure of, it's like patronizing, no? It's mecenatismo. Uh, so all, all the, all the, most of the work in architecture was distributed through politics. 
And when Gardella or these guys would do a single family house in the 50s or 60s, they didn't show it too much because it was not politically correct to no, to do work for the private capitalist do, uh, building a house for him. That's uh, quite right. With it, with so it. so the, the, the narrative was public, the narrative was political. Uh, I went into architecture school because I wanted to change the world. I didn't go to architecture school because I... I felt I was talented. In fact, I was not talented, and I'm a curator today. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we felt that architecture was the easiest way to change the world. And Zevi is a completely, uh, no, as Daria said, it chooses between literature and engineering because architecture is art, is politics, is, is uh, Bauwelt, no? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, construction. Mm -hmm. So I think we are trying to, to liberate our architect community from this now, but it's very, very difficult. And, and we have some Italian architects here who could tell you about. But I think Zavi is completely within this frame. So the intellectual is, and, and Jean-Louis wrote a wonderful book on this, the intellectual is the filter between the power and the agency of the, the artist, the architect, or or sometimes even the, the writer, no? Uh, it's an interesting story, but we're still paying the, the, the bill for this. Okay, you we, may be liberated we, from we, it, but maybe we're too liberated from it. No, no, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. but not, can, not in Italy. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree, we, but not in Italy. We have time for one, one last question or comment. Com a comment is fine as well. Yeah. Um. I just... Just because um, we were sort of talking about the nature of Zevi's writing, um, I thought that it would be interesting to, um, I mean, I think it's great that this photograph is there because as I said, when I was at the exhibition, I found this aspect of Zevi's creativity the yeah. most inspiring. Yeah, I agree. Because it's not a traditional exhibition. It doesn't have a linear narrative. Yeah. It combines the idea of an unusual kind of model, which is a frame with photographs as fragments and the enlarging of the photographs, for example, to be able to look up and see, you know, the roof of a building or something yeah. like this. So the, the fact that the exhibition is also a very particular kind of construct Media, intellectually. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really come then from the point of view of architectural history necessarily. It's really an architect's sort of yeah, deconstruction it's, it's of yeah, yeah. a kind of architectural body. And, and so just because also, Michael, you were saying all the things that we do at the GSD or we don't, um, in terms of the right, in terms of the reading, like Zevi, I, I've got the, I've got the, um, the, the, um, architecture as space in front of me and how to look at architecture. And you see that there is the content and the content has this kind of interpretive character to it from space through the ages where it's also not a narrative way of describing architectural history, which is one thing. But then you have the role of photographs and the role of drawings. Drawings are more conventional, but when you talk about, when you have the list of photographs, yeah. the photographs are okay. very absolutely, deliberate. Absolutely. You know, they're extremely deliberate. And therefore, I would say that this is also seen from the perspective of an architect who is looking for specific conditions through photography. So he has titles like architecture without internal space, which is probably, you know, the list of like monuments or surface and volume as represented in photographs or interplay of volumes as represented in photographs and so on. And so I think there's something very important in a way and the captions. about, yeah, about the way in which the book is also a specific construct and the relationship between text Absolutely. and the photography as a way of really you know presenting this idea of how one should look at architecture so i would i would say it's different in a way than tafuri but it's also a very different i mean it's a very productive way of reading architecture if you're not necessarily focused only on the text, but on the interrelationship yeah, between yeah. the text, the photograph, and the drawing. But there's also a really like a contingent thing. It was like the exchange he had with Einaudi. So what a book could sell and what a book could not. So like the the, the shift between how to look at architecture and story was exactly because Einaudi was thinking about an atlas of just pictures with just captions, and that's one also. I mean, it seems like a. 
I mean, there is a concept, but there's also like working with, with someone in Audi that was like publishing Calvino, Argan, and architecture. So it's. Mm. But I think so motion is. Motion is, I don't know if you say in English, it's putting the finger on, on a bleeding wound si. because si, si. Uh, in, in the Zevian world, <laughs> they, were, they are so taken by this kind of antagonist, uh, polemical aspect of Zevi, then, then there's no real uh, investigation on this issue of how he uses photography, which is enormous. And on the exhibitions, which are the first, I would say, contemporary approach to exhibitions in Italy and probably in Europe. They, they're curatorial in, in a good sense, not in our contemporary sense. So I think these are two aspects that are very much understudied, under-investigated in Zevi. And I think he's really an editor in a completely new way. I'm hearing some dissertation topics. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was more, about to say that. Question, so. more, from the, more, shall we get a question more from the last question? Last Last question. From the guy, uh, yeah, one for yeah, younger people. Thank you. So, sure, Zevi was a, a politician and an intellectual, but he's also a Jewish intellectual and a Jewish politician yeah. um, in, in the 1930s and 40s and beyond in an environment that was very unfriendly, to say the least, to that. Um, so I'm surprised that his ethnicity and his faith has not come up beyond what Moisen said in the, in the beginning. I was wondering if maybe you can comment on how that perhaps shaped his okay. career and his writing. Oh, yeah. We're, the, we the, the second panel. Yeah, the, the, there's the second, second panel. panel. We'll we'll address that. In, that. I'll be there. Yeah. It's a, it's a very complex issue. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, it's yes. not excised from our discussion. I will uh, I will mention it uh, quite uh, quite a bit in my final uh, uh, paper. So yeah. I think you'll hear, you'll hear about it. And it, it's a, it's a very complex and for yeah, me yeah, for me for me a very troubled one. I just want to say one thing about. Uh, 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 Zevi's com combination of visual and verbal uh, rhetorics. Uh, I think that a major, major training ground for him was bro uh, broadcasting. Oh, yes, so yes. he's, I, 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 he's I, I, someone. I he's someone who he didn't start. <laughs> yeah. His life yeah, yeah, yeah. as an intellectual, being a teacher, like, as everyone does yeah. in general, he started being an Broadcaster. agitator. Yeah, yeah. An agitator. And this the Zevi, the agitator, is a very important component. So he continued to agitate using images, yeah, but yeah, at the yeah, same time agree, with a very focused sense of the formula. And this came from uh, the, his political uh, political experience, which was a real which was a real one and in a difficult moment. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, we're going to take a break. Pamela, uh, Paige, remind me when we should be back f to resume panel two. So please be back at three o'clock. Uh, we'll take a break now. And thanks to our first two panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.